Today we are joined by our very special guest, Jess. How are you doing today? I'm good. Good. Where are you from, Jess? I'm from Langley, British Columbia, Canada. Awesome. All right. Uh, when were you first introduced to recovery? In um, November 15th, 2018. Nice. Awesome. Before Before I go too far, how's the weather up there? Are you guys freezing? It's rainy. It's very rainy. We get a lot of rain here. Oh, okay. Um, it's about eight degrees and it's raining. Good Lord. Wait, how is it eight <laughs> degrees Celsius. and raining? It's cel Celsius. Oh, so. we're different temperatures, but <laughs> we're Celsius up there and hang over the here. I think it's probably like 50 degrees. I think this is how it works. Your 40 is freezing, right? So 30. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 32 30. is freezing. Okay, so then we're about 40-something, maybe 40. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, and how long have you been uh, clean and sober, Jess? Just over 27 months. Oh, congratulations. That's awesome. Um, and then what? what is your uh, clean date? November 15th, 2018. Awesome. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, well, without further ado, we're going to turn it over to you to share your story with us. So take it away, Jess. So my name is Jessica and I'm an alcoholic slash addict. Thank you for having this opportunity for me to share my story. Um, I was born in 1983 to a lady who suffered from her own demons. Um, she suffered addiction issues and um, had five children. So three of us were uh, with her and in, taken into foster care at a young age. Um, she would leave my older brother to go to the hockey game and left him locked in the closet for a few days. And uh, mm. so yeah, we were removed from her care and put into foster care. And uh, I saw about 11 homes in nine months. Wow. And um, both my brother and uh, brothers and I have an older brother and a younger brother. We were all three of us were adopted in 1987. We were adopted to uh, two parents who had one daughter already. Um, and this was up in uh, northern BC. So we were in Prince George originally. And then we moved to Fraser Lake, which is two hours west of Prince George. And we grew up 16 kilometers out of Fraser Lake. So it was very remote um, and very, sec very secluded. Um, I, although my parents did their very best to, um, to parent, they were a part of a religious a platform called the Bible Missionary Church, and hmm. that church is a cult, and oh, wow. um, taught us that God was a God of punishment, and that um, we were sinners and in this world, but not of this world. And so, at a young age, I was enforced that I was not good enough, that hmm. I. Uh, wasn't worthy of being loved because God himself couldn't love me. And mm. my birth parent, my birth mom herself couldn't love me enough because she couldn't take care of me and enough to clean up. And those are some things I've come to understand as an adult, but as a child, it created an awful lot of pain. Yeah. Um, and uh, so we didn't go to public school. So I started school at the age of six at our private church school. Um, and my parent, my dad worked for the school district. So he was able to um, get us on the bus to take from our house to um, the school in, in the town. Um, but we were different. So we wore dresses with these massive glasses. Um, yeah. didn't cut our hair, no makeup, no outside music was allowed. Um, we weren't like, we were in the world, but we weren't of the world. So we yeah. weren't allowed friends inside of the church. We weren't allowed to uh, like hang out too much with them. We had to be within our circle. 
And uh, so taking the public school bus was uh, a bit of a bullying situation where the kids didn't understand, of course, that you're different and um, a lot of fun was made because you visibly look different. And mm -hmm. then we would have our second stop at school. So we would get off at a separate stop from all the other kids. So, of course, then that's even more um, it's more it's more of a challenge because then you have you're ostracized right you're not part of the you're not part of the world either and you're not part of your own cult um yeah. anyway so we had a pastor that was in our church from the age of six to nine who sexually abused my sister and i and uh he um my sister had it worse than i did but i still had a lot of a lot of issues surrounding that um all these things consistently enforced to me that I wasn't good enough and that and that nothing I could do could change that. Um, even though I was a child and uh, and there was a lot of um, there was just a lot of things I wasn't taught how to process emotion and I didn't know how to move these things around. So by the age of 12, I was had an eating disorder and was um, my arms against the corner of the wall to cut my arm. Um, I just had the pain that was inside that I couldn't get out and I um, I needed to feel physical pain in order to be able to deal with the emotional pain. Um, yeah. And then when I was 12, between the age of 12 and 15, my older brother also molested me. Um, yeah. And it was, um, that was created an awful lot of fear because that's your, my blood brother. Yeah. Um, and, and it's someone you're supposed to trust. And it was a lot of fear just to tell me that if I ever told anyone that, um, that he would kill me and um to sneak in and out of the my room and then make me feel unsafe by saying that someone broke in and like just just a whole mind game mm -hmm. and um so i left home when i was seven oh sorry my parents put the boys back in group care once um once they discovered what was going on i had my younger brother who was constantly punching me uh, every day and so I just I was just a scared little girl I had uh, I had um, to run we, my my bedroom was at the very end of a long hallway and so mm -hmm. I would turn the light on and I would run through the basement and uh, the same when I was going upstairs I'd have to run through that area of the house to try not to get mugged by my brother um, and, uh, then uh, I um, it was 17 years old my mom oh sorry yeah my Mom had to put my the boys back into uh, foster care because of like their abuse and they were trying to keep me safe. And when they finally found out all this information, they uh, they removed them from the home. Um, that was a safety thing, but it was also something that took away the people that I knew and took away my blood, like my blood siblings. So there was more trauma and more um, pain associated with that. Um, and I didn't have any skills to deal with that. So um, my mom had a nervous breakdown and I was left to care for her and my dad. Um, I'd never seen my dad cry before except for that day. I remember when they put the boys back in care and my dad like just sobbing, like the, he had failed them and um, the, his heartbreak. And I, I will never forget that day of seeing a man cry. I'd never seen a man cry. And so it impacted me a lot, like throughout the, as an adult, they'd be like, why are you crying? Like, you don't have anything to cry about. It's <laughs> just awful. Yeah. Men, you're allowed to cry. Men, you are allowed to cry. It's okay. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> I, I cry all the time. Eric knows this. <laughs> yeah, David's, David's a pretty big crier. Um, you know, whether it's, you know, whether it's like the notebook or a fucking sunset. You know, Dude, I'm not the notebook. Niagara. The notebook it's doesn't do Niagara. it for me. It's fucking Niagara Falls over there, David. <laughs> yeah, so at 17, I told my dad, I said, my mom and I are going to kill each other and I need to leave because she's going to kill me. And uh, mm. I asked him to drive me to the bus stop, which is the Greyhound up here. And uh, mm -hmm. he drove me to the bus stop and I was about $16 short for a ticket. And he gave me money. I got on that bus and I never went home for like 10 years after that. I was gone. 
But then I uh, went up to Moberly Lake, which is another area of BC. It's up further. And uh, I got my first job. I was like, I was starting to adult a bit and trying to sort my way through things. And uh, then shortly after that, I made the second step of leaving the cult because I moved from home to live with some family friends. I lived in their tent trailer. And then um, I had to try to get out. So I moved to Quinell where there was another family friend and it was there that I was making the, the steps to leave the church, the final steps. So it was mm-hmm. like putting out ties with friends. I was um, trying out a new life. I was growing up. I was doing my own thing. And uh, it was in Quinell that I took my very first drink. And I honestly can't forget that day because I was at a very classy establishment called the Purple Onion. And um, they ha- they have these mirrors on the wall, and I remember like because I was I was raised wearing dresses and I was wearing jeans, and I remember dancing because that's what you do when you're drunk, I guess. Yeah. And uh, and happy. Totally. Because alcohol makes you feel happy. Um, I was dancing, and I remember looking in the mirror, and I vividly remember me saying, "God, you look like such an idiot." <laughs> well, that idiot continued. She continued off the hard, very hard. Um, it, when I drank, it was something that gave me freedom from that pain, mm-hmm. and it numbed it. And so, all like the eating disorders that I had had not released it like alcohol could. And it wasn't very long until I was in Vancouver. I was 19 years old in Vancouver, and I got in with the wrong crowd down here, and I started um using cocaine and then uh it went downhill real fast from there i ended up in calgary um, at a friend's house out there doing things i'm not proud of and um two weeks later i had a um a man from here vancouver tell me that he promised that he could help me get clean if i came back to vancouver he'd pay my way back to vancouver he'd help me he'd get me cleaned up so i took that opportunity mm-hmm. and being and at 23 i married him now 23 years old he was he was 23 years older than i was so there's a very oh, large wow. age gap and um i cleaned up for the most I cleaned up when I got pregnant with my oldest daughter um, and I um, went clean for seven years mm-hmm. um, I still drank in there um, and when my daughter turned one years old her dad and I had separated and uh, we were it went into like a really long extensive court case and I remember I did drink throughout that time pretty heavily because it was still numbing that pain of not having her with me. And um, he was older and more able to manipulate the system. So he had her and um, I wasn't using at the time. And then, and then I met someone and, uh, and that was in 2010. Mm -hmm. Um, I started, I I decided that I could, uh, I could try it again. And I remember we were at the, a party and I just kind of like battled with my own will. Like, do I, should I, or should I not? I mean, like it's been so long, I'm sure I can control it. It's fine. I mm-hmm. can do this. And then, and then it started a 10 year spiral and, uh, I had two more children in that time. Mm-hmm. Um, my seven year old, I mean, I have a nine year old daughter as well now. And, uh, she was at the very beginning of the spiral. Um, but I really tried to be there for the kids. I took them out to do things with them. I was, I was uh, constantly going places with them. But the thing is, I look back and I barely remember these things because I was always loaded or I was always, I was not present. Even though I did these things and there's pictures to show it, my eyes were just blank. I had nothing mm-hmm. and my soul was, was, um, and so 2017 i get pre- or 2016 i get pregnant with my son and uh my spouse at the time did not want to have another one and uh that was a big mental struggle for me um and we we ended up keeping like i i kept him and then um he so as soon as I had him, 
-hmm. I came back from the hospital and I started using. And I would do like, you know, the dump and pump, or the pump and dump. And then at three months, I decided that I was no longer breastfeeding and I gave, um, uh, I gave the excuse that he was too, he grew too fast and that my milk wasn't good. Well, mm -hmm. it was really so that I could start drinking more and using more without the guilt behind it because you don't know how long it stays in your system for. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, two months after I had him, uh, I had a gallbladder attack and ended up having to have gallbladder surgery. And um, I left the hospital like, you know, a couple hours after surgery, they send you home. And mm -hmm. I was high and drunk within like three hours of being home. I was, I was already using and it. I started to realize that it might have a problem. Now I should have seen it a long time before that, but I just couldn't. It's like your brain is blinded to the fact that something's wrong. You just know mm -hmm. that that's the only solution you have. And I exercise that solution to its fullest extent. Um, then I remember driving. I used to live beside a cemetery, and and um, this is getting into early or mid twenty eighteen. Mm -hmm. And I remember feeling like I felt like if I could just be six foot under the ground, that maybe mm -hmm. this pain would finally stop. And I thought that, and then you feel guilty for thinking that because I have children, and um. But it's just this thing inside of me, this pain that I had was just, it was so big and it didn't go anywhere. It just sat there and it just made things really bad. And mm -hmm. so I was trying to use to, to mask it. I was trying to drink to mask it. But now I'm drinking like three days straight in order to, to quiet anything. In order to sleep, I'm not sleeping. I'm I'm not eating. I'm really in a very bad place and everyone always was like you're so strong you're so strong and I was so angry because I just felt like I was so broken and yet no one could see mm -hmm. and um, so 2018 October 2018 I um, I found that uh, I um, remember being outside and I was on a suicide for uh, suicide crisis line for like three hours and I was calling and I was just like, I was just at the end of my rope. I, there was nothing like I couldn't, couldn't make it. I was, I thought I was drowning and, uh, I laid in bed that night and I had to work the next morning, but I laid in bed at three thirty in the morning and I was like, you know, like I'm not religious. Okay. But I, there's something out there bigger than us. That's why the, galaxies can't be understood by astrologists that's why things this something's mm -hmm. bigger yeah. um i was like whatever it is that's out there can you please do something to change my life because i am sick and tired of this and i'm going to die and i honestly that night thought that i was going to die I, my heart was racing my everyone in the house is sleeping i'm not waking them up i was it was just done for me and uh within a month well, actually, the next morning I can. There's more to that story. So the next morning I um, called in sick to work because I was just, you know, four hours later. I'm not sober yet. I can't drive yet. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and I call him and uh, I was like, hey, listen, I'm really sick. I'm not gonna be able to make it. And I hung up the phone and then I called him back and I said, I'm gonna be honest with you. I was on suicide crisis line for three hours last night. I am not okay. I need to take today to try to sort my stuff out. I have a cocaine problem. And uh, they were like, whoa, we didn't know that. I'm like, well, I'm going to work and I'm sleeping on my lunch breaks because I haven't slept in days. So probably <laughs> probably a good sign something's not quite right. Yeah. Um, but uh, so they were like, okay, hey, well, take today and then come into the office. And uh, so I did, and I spent all that day calling, calling detoxes, calling treatment centers, calling what my next step should be. Mm -hmm. um, I ended up, I ended up deciding through like my spouse at the time. I talked to him, and I was like, "Would you mind if I go away for a little bit, like into a treatment facility? Um, would you be able to take the kids? Because I, I feel like I need that. At that time, both were using, and I didn't feel that I could stay sober in the house." Yeah. Um, then, uh, so he's like, do you do whatever you need to do? That's, that's good. You, you take your time. 
And uh, so I applied to go to Puritanville Treatment Center in Abbotsford, um, which is a women's facility. And mm -hmm. um, I was allowed to take my son with me, which was am amazing because he was so young. Yeah. And um, so this is the miracle that I think happened. Is like when I, I prayed out that night or I called out for help from something, a month later, November 15th, I walked into the treatment facility. And it was like my whole world has shifted. I yeah. asked for help and everyone came forward to help me. It was amazing. Like the people that cared about me and I finally saw that people cared mm -hmm. if I had just opened my mouth to me. Um, and uh, so I walked into that treatment center and I remember I cried for like the first three weeks straight, two weeks, three weeks straight. I cried and cried and cried like every pain in my world just came out there and it was a safe place for me to, to put, start putting the pieces back together. And, mm -hmm. um, it was in there. Like I went to treatment thinking that I had a cocaine problem and I discovered while I was in there that I had a drinking problem too. And, uh, I was like, okay, well, I guess I'm not drinking anymore. I was like, and that was a really hard commitment because it didn't, I just was thinking I was just going to stop one substance and that I was fine and, you know, mm -hmm. life will carry on. Yeah. But then you realize that it would just won't. And, um, and so I came out of treatment. Um, I made a bunch of friends in, inside, which is something that I don't think happens very often, but we had a really good group of women at the same time yeah. that I was there and they have really stuck through with me. They have been there with me for the last two years. They've been great. We have our little posse going on. Um, and uh, so my spouse and I did fairly well. Like he continued to drink and he uh, did his thing and I, it was pretty good. Like I, I came out and I lived for a year and a half with him while he was still drinking mm -hmm. and uh, we realized that we were on separate ships going two different directions. And yeah. so eight months ago we separated and um, we're moving on with our life now. But I want to say when I was in treatment, I discovered the big book of AA and mm -hmm. I, when I opened up the pages, I literally felt connected to something for the very first time in my entire life. I felt like I belonged somewhere and I felt like somebody was describing me on paper and I connected with the program. And so I am very thankful to, to AA for what it's offered me. I've tried, uh, my first meeting was NA back in mm -hmm. October, 2018. That was the first meeting that I went to and there was one lady there. And honestly, she meant she gave me hope. And I had never had that before. Someone just directed and talked to me and I was listening and I was crying and I was just like, something's very wrong here. But she was like, hey, it's going to be okay. She was convinced it was going to be okay. And I was like, yeah. okay, well, I just got to trust her. Well, I messaged her on my two year sober and I was like, I had her number and I was like, you don't know me, but I went to a meeting where you shared at. And I just want to say that your share changed my life. <laughs> and she's like, right. she's like, who are you? <laughs> But uh, so far, like I stay very active with my recovery. I have mm -hmm. do three to four meetings a week, um, and I'm active on Twitter as well. Awesome. Um, I do a lot of the reaching out um, and helping those that are still suffering. Mm -hmm. um, going to be starting myself a step group here, and uh, going to be working with some new people with the steps. So hopefully pass on what I've been given so freely. Um, it's been quite a miracle. I'm very present in the situation now. So when I'm with my kids and I'm actually with them and I've got to say when I'm happy, I am genuinely happy. It is yeah. an emotion that I, I've learned to discover and it is absolutely incredible. Awesome. So I think that brings me to the end of that blurb. All right. Well, we definitely have some questions <laughs> for you. Would you like to go first, Eric? Mm -hmm. Sure. I'll go first. Um, so I think, you know, kind of talking about, I, I want to bring it back to the call. Um, of because, course you do. Yeah. We, we don't have very many people. Um, we, we've had, you are, we've had a, a handful. 
We have had a handful of people who've had caught experience or exposure, I suppose. Um, Mm -hmm. So one of the things, and this is probably, it's probably very different, but I'm I'm curious, um, there has to be a reassimilation process or, or an assimilation process into society from a cult. Mm. And I'm curious, how was that process for you, you know, living your life this certain way for so long and trying to reassimilate into the world? Oh, it's still, I still feel it sometimes. Like some of the ways that I think, um, one of the big ones is believing in creation, creation or evolution. And mm. because it was ingrained into my brain, from as a child all the way through because I graduated in the private school. Mm-hmm. It's something I can't grasp. And I have tried and tried and tried to grasp evolution. And I just can't because it's and it's affected like everyone's made fun of me for believing in creationism. Everyone's like, why can't you? Why don't you understand? I'm like, it's a different timeline. <laughs> like, it's like, <laughs> it's like that. Even like responses, I see how um, like we didn't have TV. So um, people will talk about movies and singers and I will not, when I watch a movie, it doesn't go in. It doesn't, it doesn't absorb unless I like watch a movie again later and I'll be like, Hey, I think I've seen that one. <laughs> people will be like, have you seen this movie? And I'll be like, I don't know. Like, why do you ask me these questions? You know, I don't know. And like artists names mm-hmm. definitely don't fit with me. Those things do. Um, but I can like play classical music on the piano from years ago. I just can't, I can't remember like who, like I know who Bon Jovi is for instance, but I don't know like half these other names. I'm like, who are these people? And then I see a picture and then I'm like, okay, I, I get it. But yeah, <laughs> I know it completely affected everything that I've, that I've, I've had to relearn everything. And um, how to interact with people when we had, we were taught how to in our school because our school was um, multi-grade. So like from grade 12 to to kindergarten. So we did learn how to, to associate with every age category. So that mm-hmm. was easy and that was easier outside. But yeah. um, trusting people was one thing because we had trust in our circle, but you can't trust everyone outside in the world. And so that pain and like learning how to, how to make friends and how to figure out who your friends are and to, to be able to open up and trust people outside. has been a journey too. Hmm. So real quick, I, I have to ask, and I'm sorry, this, like you, you brought up creationism. So I, I just have to ask. Um, so hopefully I, I don't offend you. Um, mm-hmm. What about dinosaurs? I believe there are dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I, I have to ask. Ark. I'm sorry. Like, I believe what? they're before Noah's Ark, though. I don't think they survived the flood. Okay. <laughs> okay. I we won't go. We won't go deep into this rabbit hole. But I had to ask. Let's not. Let's not because I don't have <laughs> answers for everything. I just know that I've tried. Like we went to the dinosaur museum in Drumheller as a family back in the day, a couple years back, and uh, I sat in front of that timeline for evolution timeline for almost an hour, looking at it, trying <laughs> to understand it. And I was like, I just can't. I'm like, and I was so disturbed after I went back home. I was like, so messed up. I, like, I just don't understand. <laughs> No, it makes sense. I mean, you, you, you were brought up a certain way, right? So like, it does make sense that after being brought up a certain way, it would be very difficult if you have one perception of the world. And then all of a sudden someone was like, no, that's wrong. Here's this whole other perception of the world that, you know, everyone else lives by. So I can imagine there's like a shock if you're not like, you know, aware of both. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure there is. And like the concept of like even God, for instance. So AA teaches us that it's a higher power of your own understanding. And um, it took me a little bit to get to the point where it wasn't my parents' God anymore. That mm-hmm. it was my own higher power. And um, when I left treatment and I went and my spouse at the time, of course, it was a year and a half of drinking in the home. And I get asked, like, how did you stay sober? And I was just, I say it is my own journey and I am only responsible for myself. And that is what kept me going. Like, that's, 
um, being able to trust in something new, you know, something, something that 100% worked in my life because I would have died that night if it wasn't for that thing. And mm -hmm. in treatment, I was like, it's the, it's the universe or it's like, you know, it's out there and, uh, it's whatever's bigger outside there. And, uh, and I reserve the right to change it as I go along. And so Absolutely. that's been a growing process for me. All right. Um, and actually my question sort of goes right along with like what you were talking about. Um, so how have you, like what steps did you have to take and like what work did you have to do to sort of heal and move forward spiritually uh, in recovery coming from such a, uh, I guess, in a way, like traumatic uh, spiritual upbringing in the cult. Like, how 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 did you like reconcile that and then move forward with like your own uh, higher power of your understanding? Um, I felt so. How would you answer that? I had to break it right down to basics. Mm -hmm. Um, go right down to what was I taught and what's the, like the, what was the humans, like what did humans teach me and what did, you know, spiritual healing? Like I always believe there's that thing that looks outside your eyes. And for a long time, that thing that looked outside my eyes was very broken mm -hmm. and it was very hurt. And I started to be able to put pieces back together because um, in treatment, they talked about accepting and we did a life altering event uh, uh thing there and it was called 36 events and it mm -hmm. was like you had to write down 36 things that you remembered in your childhood and the pr the principle is that it wasn't all bad you know there was there was good in there okay. um and those, the, your brain tends to take the like the 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 traumatic things and make them bigger instead of just being an event they become much larger than that um okay and and so like taking god for instance or um, my higher power i had to really realize that oh forgive first off and then realize that um it was my parents god and this church's god it wasn't the god that everyone else understands or knows mm. mm -hmm. all right awesome back to you eric all right so um I'm sorry to continue a little bit with the the I mean this is still kind of similar I guess with the cult stuff um but you know how is your and and this is kind of a question too that goes with just kind of alcoholism and drug addiction and something we always look at but what is your relationship like with your family now that you've kind of you know chosen a different way of life so um my parents actually left that church um, about eight years ago, I think it is. Eight years ago when the abuse from the school teacher came out um, mm. and the church took the pastor's side and hired him a lawyer. Mm. So they left the church after that happened. Um, and we... It took a long time because at first I wasn't talking to my parents and they weren't talking to me and we had a very strained relationship and we wouldn't spend very much time together. Um, and it took a long time to grow up and understand that, you know, they had what they had at the time and, um, and they did the best that they could. Um, mm -hmm. it, uh, we are pretty close now. We're, we call each other often and, um, and yeah, they're, they're good now. It seems like they're very understanding and I talk to them about why I believe the way that I do and, and they are open to it. So that's good. Yeah, it's good. But when awesome. I first left though, I was writing like 23 girls letters and I got, I didn't get a letter back when I first, first left. And that was a bit of a shocker for me. Mm -hmm. So being awesome being cut out that was that has to feel very isolating i can imagine yeah yeah it did i felt alone 
Mm. Totally alone. Wow. All right. Um, so you talked about uh, being very active on Twitter and have, finding the, like, the recovery community on there. So I just want to know, like, uh, how important has social media been, and like specifically Twitter, if that's the case, uh, how, how important and like what role has that played in your recovery? It's been huge. Like, honestly, that the handle recovery posse is, mm-hmm. is a strong handle. So very, strong. Yep. You mm-hmm. like put that in your, in your tweets. And if you're struggling, like I just, um, I just came out with some of the, um, I had quite a triggering event happen on Wednesday night that brought up a lot of my trauma. Mm-hmm. And um, I had posted about it on Twitter and um, the amount of support that came out of that was phenomenal. Um, and uh, social media, also Facebook has a group called Recovery Canada. Um, and nice. that has been that has been really amazing as well. Uh, whenever I've struggled, I went to a um, bridal party and um, they uh, – consumed edibles and it triggered like a whole because I was in a oh, different wow. city and, and I was I was not in my zone at all I wasn't around people that I really knew well um I was just very uh triggered and I got on there and they um they all talked me out they gave me like meeting names I almost I I just took my breath and they walked me through it and yeah super supportive out there I tell you awesome I think I'm, I I might join the uh, Recovery Canada group because I want to be a part of it. <laughs> awesome. All right. So I just went to a meeting. I just went to a meeting actually on last Sunday, and the girl that was the admin on that page, I ran into her, and I was like, "Hey, I know you." <laughs> She's like, <laughs> "I was like, message her on Facebook." I'm like, "Hey, I think I'm sitting behind you." <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, so moving on to the next question, you mentioned a little bit about suicide, um, during your like share and, uh, one, like one of the times where, um, one of the treatment centers I went to was for depression, um, and eating disorders and like cutting and stuff like that. So more mental health focus, uh, how, how have you gone about, treating your mental health to make sure that the thoughts of, you know, it's better to not live. Don't come back. Yes. Okay. So I am in in treatment. We discovered that I had um, a major depressive disorder and um, PTSD. So Mm -hmm. I, they put me on medication. Um, I was on, an SSRI blocker, which is my overactive brain, um, tends to go in circles and like a flushing toilet. It's that fast. Um, mm-hmm. So they put me on the blocker and it and it has stopped that flush from happening. And um, they also had me on like Seroquel for sleeping um, for a while. And uh, I also have done some extensive counseling through my trauma counselor. Um, He's been great in getting me to um, reassociate with emotion and Mm. be able to uh, place it in my body and be able to move it around. Like, so it's just awareness and grounding. And like, I just spoke to him yesterday and it was, it was amazing because I had that thing happened on Wednesday. I was like, I need to see you. I don't know what to do. I'm sober and I don't want to use as a method to, to, um, fixing this because it's, uh, it's a big mess. <laughs> he just helped me with it a lot. All right. Um, but, uh, yeah, the feeling of when you, when you are able to give back and you're able to help other people, it does give you a sense of purpose. And it gives you a sense of being able to, that you're not that bad human being, you're not that um, thing that your brain likes to tell you that you are. You yeah. know, it's, it helps you, it helps you recover. And that's how we keep it, is by giving it away. Absolutely. All right. Um, 
I have my last question. So uh, how do you approach the topic of drugs and alcohol uh, with your kids? And like they, they, they say addiction is potentially like a genetic disorder. So are you afraid that they might uh, go down that same path? And just what sort of education like do you give to prepare them for that? Okay, so my kids come to meetings with me. Okay. Um, and they've been very active with my recovery. Awesome. Um, my nine-year-old has told me, I've asked her if she wants to go to Costco or if she wants to go to a meeting, and she told me, would you rather die or go to Costco? <laughs> wow. So I think they get it. I think they understand. Yeah. <laughs> my nice. uh, oldest one is of course in the teen, early teen years and starting to experiment with things and um, mm -hmm. education about what the effects are has been important um, and also trying to make sure that she's safe if she decides to engage um, that's my job as a mother is to keep her safe um, mm -hmm. and knowing that teenagers will, will um, experiment and they will try things i want her to know that she can come and talk to me about it and and i've come to the decision of sourcing it for her if she needed to because then mm -hmm. you know it's coming from a safe source not just from another kid at school yeah um that's been a struggle for me because like you know marijuana and uh things have been a challenge for me myself um mm -hmm. I did find some in her room the other day and I was like, are you kidding me? I'm like, there's no drugs allowed in this house. Right. And mm -hmm. she's like, it's not mine. It's not mine. <laughs> you like, okay. Um, it's never, it's never anyone's. No, right? it's, you know, it's, it's never anybody's. There. No, it's never anyone. But I found this in your sock drawer. <laughs> it's not mine. I don't know how it got there. What, <laughs> like, what do you mean? Right. I was like, I'm not dumb. I remember being younger and starting out. Oh no, that's not mine. Yeah, I remember the ministry coming. Oh no, you do your homework. I, I, I never, I never use that excuse. Whenever my parents found anything, I'd be like, "Yeah, that's mine." Like I just like, "What are you gonna do? Why are you gonna lie about it?" Like you already have the weed. <laughs> <laughs> my goal is to be able to show them if they end up struggling that there is a way out. Absolutely. So, teaching them to like coming to meetings with me so they can hear their other people's stories i want them to know that they're not alone and mm -hmm. like the little guy comes to meetings quite often with me and there's other kids there so they have like their friends he calls them their friends he wants to go to a meeting mom and so it's just like it's it's good i'm very open about my struggles with it because i don't want them to feel like it's an ostracized conversation yes. it needs to be an open conversation that we have um with everyone like i even my employer knows that i have mm -hmm. i have recovery issues because or not recovery issues i have addiction issues and um it, i find it's important for me to set those boundaries and say listen i struggle with this and this is a very real thing in my life and it gives me accountability too because mm -hmm. i think about like if you're planning a relapse and your brain's going off 100 miles an hour and you're like hey listen i'm going to start using and then you're like oh crap i have to call in sick tomorrow at work they're going to know yeah. and everyone's going to know and there's a way of stopping it right so i'm very open and out front with it that i am in recovery no i don't drink and no i won't take you to the beer store and no i'm not driving you there mm -hmm. i yeah so i have my rules set around that <laughs> awesome and perfect keeps me safe. All right, Eric, you got anything else? No, I think I think we're at the uh, the end, David. Um, so I guess uh, we'd like to thank our guest, right? Absolutely. Thank you, Jess, for joining us. Woo! Woo! Yay! Thank you guys for having me. Thank you for listening to my story. Absolutely. I hope and that gives you hope. We'd like to give you one last minute to talk directly to anybody out there who's struggling and needs to hear that like uplifting uh, little message of hope to like get them through. What do you have to say to them? If you are struggling and you don't think that there's any possible way that you can find a solution, reach mm -hmm. out because there's always somebody there to help you. Uh, there mm -hmm. is ne it's never too late until it is. 
Absolutely. All right. Well, here, right. Pi oh, Eric, would you uh, give the people our uh, media statement, of please? Of course. Um, so here at Podcast Recovery, uh, we need your help to uh, keep the mics on. So um, please become Love a member that. of our home group by uh, joining the Patreon. Or please like, subscribe, comment, share, retweet, and do all of the social media things that we can do through uh, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, um, and anything else we have that I might not be aware of. Also, please visit our website. And uh, yeah, back to you, David. Also, we have a new fun way to become part of the podcast recovery family. Uh, send us a shout in our, on our Twitter or our Facebook. Uh, hit our DMs with your uh, name and address, and we will send you uh, a little rub. A Live Strong bracelet, but it now has podcast recovery on it, and it's red, right? It's red? Yep, it's red. David. Well, it would seem that David has um, gone into the me? ether. There he is. Oh, what keeps close, happening? It's so close weird. us out. Close us out, David. All right. Here at Podcast Recovery, we are aiming to expand the scope of support for recovering addicts. Accessibility and convenience of helpful services is paramount to combating addiction. We, we work to bring the message of recovery to every addict, wherever and whenever it is needed. We believe that a powerful voice of recovery should be obtainable, practical, and at the touch of a, and at the touch of a button. Every addict deserves to hear a message of hope, and Podcast Recovery is here to provide it. All right, everybody, thanks for joining us again. Uh, check us out on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, podcastrecovery.com. Uh, like, share, subscribe. And if you want to, send us a message. We'll get your message out on the airwaves. But most importantly, everybody out there, stay safe and stay clean.